Welcome to Indus Special, I'm Ajaz Heather. Tensions in the Middle East continue to rise. But before we get into a discussion of where things are headed, let me open with some thoughts for the experts we have gathered today for the discussion. The lure of, lure of battle would matter little had not the long wars it led to altered the course of world history in conflicts of prolonged destruction and suffering in wars that lasted many years or even many decades, unquote. This is how historian Cathal J. Nolan wrote in his 2017 award-winning book, The Allure of Battle, a history of how wars have been won and lost. In 1995, political scientist James Fearon argued in his article, Rationalist Explanations for War, that none of the principal rationalist arguments adequately addresses the central puzzle, namely that war is costly and risky, so rational states should have incentives to locate negotiated settlements that all would prefer to the gamble of war. At the heart of it is the desire to win decisively. What exactly is victory? Captain Emile Simpson, a British infantry officer, has a vignette in his book, War from the Ground Up. In April 1975 in Hanoi, a week before the fall of Saigon, Colonel Harry Summers of the U.S. Army told his North Vietnamese counterpart, Colonel Tu, you never beat us on the battlefield, to which Tu replied, that may be so, but it is also irrelevant. So while military professionals and politicians look for a decisive win, Nolan says it is the single hardest thing to do to translate combat into achievement of an important strategic and political goal that the other side is forced to recognize and accept when the war is over. But the allure of battle doesn't die down. The idea of surprising the enemy, the thought that a decapitation is a win, that the qualities of first, which is H.R. McMaster's term, will allow a superior military force to see first, decide first, act first, and finish decisively. That revolution in military affairs, which rests on an important suite of military capabilities, would take on a hapless enemy, deliver firepower, and leave on a high note. This, as McMaster noted, neglects war's political and human dimensions. It equates targeting to tactics, operations, and strategy. And this he calls the vampire fallacy. He says neglects war's uncertainty, based mainly on interactions with determined and elusive enemies. Here's what U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted. Let's place this in light of war's uncertainty. He, Qasem Soleimani, was a monster, and he's no longer a monster. He's dead. He was planning a big attack, a bad attack for us. I don't think anyone can complain about it. If this is strategy by the commander of the world's most powerful military, then the world, including the Americans, should be greatly worried. On this note, let me go to my panelists. I have with me George Zimuli, who is a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and joins me from Budapest. I also have with me Van Magludashian, who is a journalist based in Paris. Thank you to both the panelists. Let me begin with Van, since Van is covering this. Van, what is the sense of where things are headed? Lots of things are happening, so just list them for us. Uh, we have the Americans finally having an idea about, about how, how they can prepare their role in the Middle East post-ISIS era. Everybody today in the Middle East is preparing to act um, and have have a new political goal, a new political agenda, how to go forward after ISIS was defeated. Iranians are saying ISIS is defeated, uh, according to uh, according to uh, Qasem Soleimani himself, who, who informed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in Beirut two months ago that the, the battle against ISIS is over. The Americans, uh, the Trump administration says the same thing. Um, uh, some Europeans and some Syrians think otherwise that ISIS is not completely eliminated yet. There were there were doubts about this, but since both opposing sides are saying that ISIS is defeated, then we definitely moved on, moved into a phase in in the uh, in the country in, in the region's uh, history where ISIS is out, and all those actors who are who are working together against ISIS are now going to be confronting each other in one way or another. What, that one of those confrontations was the elimination of Qasem Soleimani that came, that came earlier, well, um, at the beginning of 2020. 
what the what what would happen next is all depends on the, the U.S. administration's willingness to continue its plan to withdraw from the region. Will they will they withdraw? Without uh, uh, America's enemies today in in Lebanon, Syria, and in in Iran, they are saying we're not going going to let American troops stay in the region. If they stay, they will be shot or killed. Um, in, in, in attacks in all over the, all over the region, will that happen? Iraqis are divided on that. Uh, the, the Syrians are divided on that. The, the, there are a lot of people close to Tehran, like Hezbollah in Iraq, like Hezbollah in Lebanon. They are worried that they are kind of losing trust in their staunch ally Bashar al-Assad, who is working day every day. In accordance with what Moscow is suggesting, with what Moscow is ordering, uh, g uh, given the, given the last uh, last meetings that took place between Bashar al-Assad and uh, Vladimir Putin in Damascus. Okay, this is very interesting. Let me ask this before George. George, a couple of things. One, if defeating ISIS uh, was the primary goal. Uh, then taking out Soleimani at this stage, thinking that ISIS has been defeated, when we know that such groups morph and they thrive on chaos, and Soleimani's assassination definitely is an event that is likely to throw the region into some kind of spiral. We've already had the Israelis uh, attack uh, one of the Iran-linked militias in eastern Syria, um, there are other statements that are coming out, and it seems that while uh, there is overall a sense, both from the U.S. side and from the Iranian side, that they don't want to go to war, they are also now in a commitment trap in so far as striking back or retaliating is concerned. And it seems to me that that seems to be the area of instability. So just give me a sense of how this thing has played out and whether it should have played out the way it did. Well, you raise a very interesting issue there because, because of course, <clears throat> the United States is, um, in theory, in Iraq uh, to fight ISIS. The United States is in Syria, in theory, to fight ISIS. So it doesn't really make very much sense than to uh, take out General Soleimani who has done more to fight ISIS uh, in um, Syria and in Iraq than anybody else. <clears throat> so why has the United States done this? Well, unfortunately, uh, for quite some time, and, but very much so during the Trump administration, um, the United States has embraced Israel's agenda. Now, Israel's agenda is very different. Israel is not preoccupied with ISIS. Israel is preoccupied with Iran, <clears throat> and in particular with the so-called uh, Shiite crescent that links Iran, Iraq, <clears throat> Syria, and Lebanon. And this is what Israel uh, is trying to thwart. So the United States <clears throat> has embraced this agenda, which serves no American interest whatsoever, because American interest is to defeat ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Sunni jihadi uh, terrorism that uh, was responsible for the 9-11 uh, attacks, that has been responsible for numerous terrorist attacks since then in the United, the United States and in Europe. So that's the U.S. interest. There is no U.S. interest in thwarting Iran. The only one who is the country that is preoccupied with Iran is Israel. And so, you know, the, when Trump talks about, well, Soleimani was going to do this, Soleimani was going to do that, he's simply embracing, embracing uh, Israel's agenda. And that is why he's been unable to present any evidence whatsoever uh, of uh, Soleimani's um, malevolent deeds that he was planning to attack all these embassies here in Baghdad and all around the world. You know, even the sheep in uh, Congress, when I say sheep, they, you know, they usually go along with what the administration tells them. Even they weren't buying the intelligence briefing that they received earlier this week. Absolutely. So, we said that, you know, Monday will be a very normal day. Uh, but here's the thing, George. Uh, I agree with you uh, in terms of the Israeli factor. I mean, the Israelis strategically have been wedded to the fact that they've got these 
three circles, they neutralized the, the inner one, Jordan, Egypt. Then there was the outer one, which was essentially Syria, Iraq, and Libya. And Iraq, of course, was taken out for them by uh, George Bush Jr. Syria is, uh, is now embroiled in a civil war. Libya is in turmoil, and that leaves Iran. Uh, and, and it seems to me, as you suggested, uh, something that I saw firsthand, uh, unfortunately, uh, when I was in, in, in Washington in the run-up to the Iraq war, that Israelis were pushing very hard for the Bush administration to actually take out Iraq. Do you get a sense that they will be successful uh, you know, in, in pursuing the same kind of strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, pushing the U.S. into a war? It seems to me that the Congress has a, a, a non-binding resolution which kind of tries to restrict uh, what uh, President Trump can do uh, in terms of actually taking the U.S. to war with Iran. Congress um, can pass these non-binding resolutions. I don't think Congress plays much of a role in all this because um, historically, U.S. presidents have had pretty much uh, complete uh, freedom in uh, undertaking military actions and not bothering with... Um, uh, seeking congressional approval. I mean, last time Congress declared war was in 1941 uh, after Pearl Harbor. Um, even the War Powers Act of 1973 has been invoked once, only once, in almost 50 years. So I don't think Congress plays much of a role in all of this. But there is a more serious issue, which is Iran is a huge, sophisticated country. I mean, it's a country of 80 million. I mean, it's a very highly educated public. Uh, they have a lot of um, military firepower, uh, as they demonstrated uh, earlier this week. So the United States doesn't have too many military options. They can't launch a, an invasion uh, as they did um, uh, in the case of Iraq. They just don't have the manpower. They don't have the resources to do it. All they can do is lob missiles and bomb targets, but Iran has shown that they can also respond. And there are thousands of U.S. servicemen in the um, uh, neighborhood who are vulnerable to attack from Iran. So if the United States wants to escalate into a, a conflict involving uh, bombing targets in Iran, Iran can respond and start uh, inflicting very serious casualties on uh, American servicemen in the, uh, in the region. So. That's yeah, but that's, that's, that's that again, that again takes us into a spiral, uh, which is what I said, that's the area of instability, because if the U.S. does something, then Iran is also committed to retaliating, and that's where things begin to, you know, the escalation ladder that all of us keep talking about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and, that's it, and that's what I'm sure um, the military chiefs told um, Trump uh, this week, when, when Trump said, well, let's uh, maybe, how, how can we respond to these uh, Iranian attacks on our military installation? They said, well, um, you bomb them, they're going to attack us. And we don't really have any means of defense. I mean, they can just simply take out um, uh, U.S. military bases and kill hundreds, thousands of uh, U.S. servicemen right away. And then, and then what does the U.S. do? Then the U.S. launches serious um, uh, missile attacks, <laughs> and then that in itself then causes retaliation. Very soon, we're up on this escalation ladder into Absolutely. nuclear weapons, go a bit. So, uh, Absolutely. the United States doesn't have too many options. It's all very well saying, we'll do this, that, and the other to Iran, but you don't actually have uh, too many options other than going all the way up to nuclear. Absolutely. Which is Absolutely. Uh, George, stay with me. Uh, I will go quickly back to Van. Uh, Van, you wanted to say something? Y yes, I, I don't think I don't think, um, uh, with all the respect uh, to the to the analysis before, I don't think the Iranians are uh, are in any position today to to retaliate in a in a in a very uh, significant manner. Uh, we saw the retaliation. We saw that they targeted uh, they t they didn't target any any U.S. military personnel. They they couldn't they didn't inflict any any casualties on the American side. Uh, the, even even a lot of Iraqis I spoke to, they they say they say the Iraqis were well informed ahead of time. Which, in my humble opinion, I think if the Iraqis were informed, it means the Americans were informed. Uh, why was that decision made to inform the Americans that they will be launching some missiles 
intentionally or unintentionally they miss their targets um, just just uh, just as just as intentionally or other uh, unintentionally they uh, they shut down an, an Ukrainian um, Ukrainian jet killing all those on board which was uh, uh, the, 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 the jury the jury of, van is still out on that because the Iranian aviation chief says that there was no way that Iran could have shot that down but let's go back to what you said uh, see as as a, as, a, as a minor as a, as a minor student yeah. of military strategy here's my view um, of this uh, it's not so much about what damage the Iranians could cause to the Americans in the barracks at the base uh, it was more a matter of actually declared missile attack against a U.S. target. So the signaling had less to do with uh, how much damage they could cause and more to do with the fact that we will retaliate. So essentially what George and I were discussing had to do with what happens if it goes into a spiral. Now, once it does, then Iran is not going to be circumspect about whether it should lob its missiles away from the Americans or lob them right into the Americans. So, so that's the real issue here. Wouldn't it have been, been better for, for, for the Allies to have killed Adolf Hitler during World War II instead of, instead of all those years of... Uh, of total destruction that occurred in Europe uh, and inflicted, uh, you know, well, millions uh, of people. During World of War Two, yeah. during World World War Two, there were technological cons constraints. That we, you know, no one had the precision standoff capability like they do today. Uh, but go on. Had they uh, managed? Had they managed? Had they managed? Yeah. Well, killing of Soleimani, I don't think. Listen, Do Donald Trump, the U.S. president. Had promised his voters to withdraw from the Middle East to Correct. stop endless wars. I don't think they are they, they want to go to a war. From what I'm understand, from what I'm seeing, uh, the Americans last year when they proposed to withdraw from the region, there was a complete um, there was a complete rejection of it. Throughout throughout the world, criticism of American withdrawal would result in the reemergence of ISIS. Uh, Americans should not withdraw the criticisms from the Democrats against the Republicans and some Republicans said we should stay in the region. I think this comes into play to make sure that to see whether the Iraqis will be asking the Americans to stay. Okay. When I spoke okay. to some Iraqi, Iraqi, Iraqi politicians a while ago, they told me they told me the prime minister, he came into power by the approval of some of some uh, of 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 Iran primarily he yeah that like that that thing has been going on when, uh, when I have I have to uh, cut you short here because uh, I need to move on but thank you so much for your insights that was van Megrudishian speaking with us is been covering the story uh, from Paris thank you so much uh, George uh, back to you on this. Uh, my argument, as I made it to Van, was that it's not so much about whether the Iranians could cause or could not cause American casualties and more to do with the fact that, you know, this was a direct declared attack against an American target. No, I absolutely agree. We agree with you. Um, and the fact that they gave warning uh, ahead of time it just shows their professionalism and their skill. Um, they did exactly what the United States did um, when they bombed Syria. They gave half an hour warning uh, to allow the military bases to be evacuated. They, so Iran did this and they launched an attack. This is the first time um, since, uh, since uh, World War II when a state openly boasts of having attacked uh, military, American military installations and the United States has elected not to uh, retaliate, at least for the time being. So that is a, that is a, a historic turning point. And yeah. by the fact that they did this in a very skillful, professional way, I think Iran's signal to the United States is that we can inflict casualties if we want to. We don't want to do it now because we don't want to go down a path of... But, uh, but, the, but, the, important, but, the, important, but the important thing was that Iran 
uh, declared and attacked a U.S. target, which I think is very significant. Stay with me, George. I'm also joined by Ambassador Matthew Breiza uh, from Istanbul. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for being uh, on the program. We're just trying to get our head around the fact that the Trump administration seems to do so many things uh, that are so contradictory that they're, you know, they're, things just seem to be wilting under the weight of those contradictions. I also, before you joined, offered my own thoughts on uh, on this whole business of war, and I, you know, I we discussed something from Cathal Nolan's book and you know James Fearon's, you know, I, explanations, rationalist explanations of war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The thing is that at the end of the day, no one really can predict an escalation ladder. I mean, in a different context, Khan talked about it, but even he said that his ladder was not predictive. So we are really into a situation where multiple wars are going on in the greater Middle East, just like there were in the Balkans in the run-up to the World War I. Now, give us a sense of how you make sense of what Donald Trump has done. Right. Um, those are great points. And um, first remark is, yeah, as you observed, Donald Trump has taken contradictory actions, or, or put it this way, the assassination of, uh, of Qasem Soleimani uh, runs contrary to President Trump's political objectives and, and makes me think, therefore, that there's, no, there's clearly no strategy. What do I mean? Donald Trump's main objective, in my mind, in, with regard to Iran, is to entice the Iranians back to the negotiating table. So he, seeing himself as the world's greatest deal maker, is able to negotiate uh, and achieve what he will call a better deal than that of his predecessor, Barack Obama. Um, he also uh, wants to keep U.S. troops in the region, uh, but not too many. He wants to bring most home, but he knows that if there are no U.S. troops in the Mideast region, then he's unable to achieve the second goal of the United States uh, with regard to Iran, which is to constrain uh, Iran's axis of resistance, and so-called axis of resistance, stretching from uh, Iran all the way to the Mediterranean. This step of uh, assassinating Soleimani works contrary to those two political objectives because, A, how can any leader of a country uh, who just was the victim of an act of war, an assassination uh, abroad, come to the negotiating table. And B, uh, pr this action has set in motion the Iraqi government's now request for U.S. troops to depart Iraq. Yes, there was that vote on Sunday by part of the Iraqi parliament, which only the Shiites showed up. But I just saw that now today, uh, the prime minister of Iraq called the U.S. secretary of state to say, please come here, let's start negotiating the, uh, the, the procedures for the U.S. troops to leave. So yes, very much contradictory. And so finally, last remark, how, what does Donald Trump think he's doing? There's been some great reporting uh, by the Washington Post uh, based on leaks from senior administration officials that shows that for months, Secretary of State Pompeo had been urging President Trump to kill Soleimani for, for a number of reasons, um, but he kept on losing the internal battle within the administration. Finally, uh, Pompeo appears to have taken advantage of Trump's desire to do something, to look tough, especially with the presidential election uh, season heating up. So one thing Trump did was order those airstrikes on, on, the, on the militia, uh, in, uh, the Iran-supported militia in Iraq. But the other thing he decided to do was to kill Soleimani. And again, the, the reporting shows that um, senior military officials were shocked that President Trump chose this, this option for retaliation because uh, uh, this, uh, uh, for the killing of the contractor, U.S. contractor, because this was the most extreme option. So it's an option that runs contrary to the achievement of the administration's strategic goals, which means they're freelancing. They're trying to come up with a strategic rationale after the action. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing. Um, I was um, going through what uh, General H.R. McMaster said. I mean, he, he made some very interesting points once uh, when he was speaking somewhere. And he, he talked about these fallacies. And, you know, one of the fallacies that he talked about was a vampire fallacy. And the other one that he talked about was a zero dark 30 fallacy. And he says, and, you know, I mentioned this before you joined us, the qualities of first, as he put it, uh, will allow a superior military force to see first, decide first, act first, and finish decisive. Uh, and he said that, and you know, he also talked about the revolution in military affairs, and he says that it rests on important suite of military capabilities. 
uh, and uh, you know the idea is to take on a hapless enemy, deliver firepower, and leave on a high note. But then he said that this neglects war's political and human dimensions. It equates targeting to tactics, operation, and strategy. And this fallacy neglects war's uncertainty based mainly on interactions with determined and elusive enemies. So this whole idea of special forces operations, which are important in a, in a tactical kind of way, do not really add up to a strategic mosaic. We have seen this in Afghanistan. We saw this in Iraq. We've, we're witnessing this in Syria, in Libya. How many more lessons do we need to imbibe before we realize that today's wars cannot be won decisively. Um, and you, you, you see a reflection of what you just said uh, in the way NATO, as an organization, has handled the war in Afghanistan. Um, that's referred to not as a strategic plan, but it's crisis management operations. So the, the, the Western militaries have become structured for managing crisis rather than, well, following the dictate of another great po political military thinker, von Clausewitz, who taught yeah. us that war is the continuation of politics by other means. Your political goals- But, but Matthew, sorry for, uh, Matthew, sorry for interjecting. You're making a very important point. But managing crises would, to me, sensibly require not starting a crisis in the first place. <laughs> right, but sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, you find yourself in a situation, I think, like the Trump administration felt it was in, whereby there had been months of what they were calling provocative Iranian actions. You, you know the list, right? The, yeah. The uh, mining of tankers, the attack on the Saudi oil facility. And I think the administration felt we better do something, something to provide a deterrent, to stop the escalatory ladder from moving higher, or from moving higher up the escalatory ladder. But yeah, once you start moving up the escalatory ladder, things things get difficult, they get dangerous. And one of the great cliches also uh, in military parlance is uh, uh, every war plan is perfect until it's first contact with the enemy, right? Then things get really complicated. The fog of war sets in. Um, the one. The one thing I can say that's positive out of, out, out of my reflections on, on what just happened is that um, for there actually to be a war, uh, other than, well, well even, even if there's sort of an uncontrolled uh, escalation in process, ultimately one side has to want the war, right? If, if there's not one side that intends on, on launching a war, uh, then there's not going to be a war. And in this case, it was clear to me, neither Washington nor Tehran wanted a war. Uh, and fortunately then, as, as the prior guest was saying, uh, when push came to shove, uh, after, after the uh, U.S. assassinated Soleimani, Iran's counterattack was a, a, a great example of super clear diplomatic messaging, right? I mean, um, the use of force is a diplomatic tool. And the way the Iranians Absolutely. made sure- Absolutely, it's, 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 it's not an end in itself. Uh, but before I wrap up the segment, I mean, uh, George, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, Errol Morris had this great documentary with uh, Robert Strange McNamara called 11 uh, Lessons from uh, the Life of Robert Strange McNam McNamara, The Fog of War. And the first one that uh, McNamara talked about was empathizing with the enemy. And he actually gives the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and, and the two letters that Khrushchev wrote and how the U.S. Uh, reacted uh, ultimately to the soft one rather than the hard one. You really think that we have adults in the room on both sides where they will empathize with each other? I, I have doubts. Um, the track record isn't terribly good. Um, it's true that the Cuban Missile Crisis was um, negotiated um, successfully. Um, but many other crises and many other conflicts that um, the United States was involved in, armed conflicts, were not negotiated uh, thoroughly. Um, if one thinks of um, Vietnam, where, where the United States was continually under the delusion that they can uh, you know, escalate gradually and then de-escalate gradually and, and send all, my, all manner of signals to um, uh, the enemy with Hanoi and the Viet Cong, uh, how to bring this war to an end, it didn't work out that way. Um, and, and we're seeing the same kind of thing uh, in many places. I mean, it's like, it's great to start a war, but then um, once you're in it, it's, uh, it's actually very difficult to um, affect the, uh, the results that you want. 
So okay. um, the ambassador talked about um, uh, the, the uh, Trump's uh, goals that he wants to renegotiate uh, the nuclear yeah, well, deal. I, uh, well, I think that's doing. well, I that's water under the bridge, George. Uh, thank you so much. Unfortunately, I have to wrap up now. Uh, very grateful uh, to Ambassador Matthew Bryza, George Simuli for speaking with us. We're going to take a short break, and at the other end of the break, continue with this discussion of the crisis in the Middle East. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. We are discussing the crisis that began with the U.S. targeted assassination of Major General Qasem Soleimani and, uh, and of course, Iran's retaliation. Thereafter, uh, I now have with me uh, Mohammed Marandi, uh, who is a very senior analyst, joins me from Tehran. Uh, Mr. Marandi, uh, I just want to be very specific with reference to any possibility of escalation. Uh, the U.S. As a, as a superior power thinks that it can control the escalation ladder. Uh, what would be the Iranian response? We have, of course, seen one set, uh, you know, the, the missile attack at two American bases. But it seems to me that Iran was just saying that we are, we are not really going, targeting you. But we are showing you the resolve, resolve that we will directly declare attack against a, a U.S. target. But if it begins to escalate, what would Iran's choices be? Well, I think the Iranian missile, missile strike was very significant because every single missile, missile that the Iranians fired went right through the U.S. air defense system. The Americans failed to intercept a single missile. A, not a single missile was downed. And then when we look at the satellite photos, a single missile hit their target. They either hit, either hit hangars or they hit buildings. None of them were, fell into fields. They all struck their targets, and I think that and created extensive damage. The Iranians weren't targeting soldiers because they didn't strike the barracks. They struck the buildings where drones and helicopters and and sophisticated technology were held because the Iranians have very good intelligence from inside these bases. So this sent a very strong mes message to the United States that if you, es you escalate all of your bases in the Persian Gulf region and in Iraq could be hit very hard because Iran has many thousands of, su of such missiles and many thousands of drones. If Americans escalate if they attack if they would have attacked again and used they would have to use military bases in the region Correct. those military bases not only be, be attacked but those regimes that aid the united states in its in its attacks will be seen as hostile states and they would yes they would definitely suffer the consequences so okay. trump recognized yeah sure and these go, regimes go on, go on. They on trump to end this and okay. that's why he stood down Okay, uh, I get your point about it. So it's a very significant point with reference to the fact that uh, none of the ballistic missiles got intercepted by the U.S. air defense, ground air defense. Uh, and of course, it seems to me the way they struck the bases that these missiles are pretty accurate uh, CEP uh, for counterforce targeting. But here's my question. Uh, why was the decision not taken to actually use uh, the two types of uh, cruise missiles that Iran has, Sumar and Huweza, if I am not wrong, um, it would have been even more difficult to inter intercept them, and it's easier for the cruise missiles, uh, uh, you know, in terms of counterforce targeting. Well, I think the Iranians were sending the Amer Americans a message that even their older missiles can go right through the U.S. defense systems and let alone Iranian new missiles. And the Iranians don't want to show their hand, as they say, with regard to their technology. They have a lot that the Americans don't know about, and they want to keep it that way. The important thing for Iran, though, is that the Americans recognize that, they're, that they are in trouble, that they cannot defend themselves against missiles and drones. And I think that the Iranians have proven that. But I think the major threat to the United States is actually in Iraq. 
because the Americans carried out an act of war against Iraq as well. They murdered a high-ranking Iraqi war hero. They've murdered Iraqi soldiers. They've outraged Iraqis. We saw the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis take part in the funerals in Qasimane, in Najaf, and Karbala for the Iranian and Iraqi commanders, which shows that the narrative that Iran is unpopular in Iraq is nonsense. We saw how popular General Soleimani is in Iraq. But I think the fact that Iraqi parliament has said the Americans must go, the prime minister said that, who said the Americans yeah, that's must a, go. That's a, very significant, that's a very significant development. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Marandi, for speaking with us. I was Mohammed Marandi speaking with us from Tehran. I am also joined by Amar Karim, who is an Iraqi journalist based in Baghdad, works with the AFP, has been covering Iraq since 2003. Mr. Karim, thank you so much for being with us. I have a simple question. Uh, the U.S. targets Iran, uses the, and does so on the Iraqi soil. The Iranians target the U.S. and once again, uh, it's on the Iraqi soil. Uh, this must be a, 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 you know, a cause for deep concern as far as Iraq and its sovereignty is concerned. Would you agree with me? Yeah, absolutely. That has been uh, the issue since uh, the beginning of the, of the since the beginning of the Iraq caught in the middle of this uh, sort of proxy war. It was a lot of concern. Uh, it was uh, 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 the, the first thing when it started by the airstrike hit uh, Soleimani, and then followed by the 22 missiles that hit Iraqi uh, uh, the, the U.S. base inside Iraq. Um, all things here inside Iraq now is uh, today, for example, the Merjaiya in Najaf, the, the most powerful uh, religious authority in the country, have emphasized on uh, respecting Iraqi sovereignty. Uh, and they actually said the Iraqi government were not able to do uh, that much to protect Iraqi sovereignty. So, uh, general feeling in Iraq, it was a uh, violation for the Iraqi uh, sovereignty. And uh, uh, the only good thing for, for the time being uh, that this issue a bit uh, eased uh, recently with the final uh, uh, statement by Trump and also by Iran, which they thought uh, they, they said this is like sort of end of the session. Uh, yes, but I agree with what you just mentioned. It was a violation for the Iraqi sovereignty and its big concern in Iraq uh, in popular level and also in politics. Okay, so tell me, the Iraqi parliament uh, says that the U.S. should leave. Now, the Iraqi prime minister called uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo and said, you want to come here so that we work out a schedule for your withdrawal. So now, it seems to me Iraq is very serious. Is this finally the death of the status of forces agreement that Iraq had with the U.S.? Well, uh, yeah, I can say so. It's a uh, it's very difficult, complicated uh, relation now between Iraq and the uh, U.S. Uh, it, it became sort of uh, uh, a pleased uh, uh, relation. It used to be uh, good after 2014. U.S. have participated in uh, defeating ISIS, but Iraq became uh, 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 threatened. And then uh, this uh, U.S. has helped with all these coalition forces. Uh, but after uh, what happened uh, on last Friday, now it's uh, it's in Paris. The government of Iraq, uh, who are who were trying always to hold the the stick from the middle between uh, Iran and the U.S., who were like almost yeah. uh, okay. fighting. Thank uh, you. I, I get your point. Uh, your point, Omar Kareem. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm also joined by Philip Ingram, who's a journalist, but has had a long and a uh, distinguished military career as an intelligence security officer and strategic planner. Mr. Ingram, thank you for being with us. Before you joined us, we've had this discussion about the whole idea of war and decisive victories and the rest of it. And what we have seen for a very long time is the fact that, you know, bombing runs, uh, special ops raids, decapitation of people, does not really win us wars. We've seen this in Afghanistan, in Iraq earlier, we're witnessing this in Syria, in Libya. But it seems to me that the lessons are not being learned. What is your sense of what has happened? And do you think that there's going to be some kind of escalation spiral here? 
Well, I, I think with modern modern conflict, it's very difficult unless there is a, a very clear end state, which is never dictated by the politicians before they get engaged, um, to declare a victory against. You know, we go back to the Second World War, which the last time war was formally declared. You've got a hard surrender and someone signs a surrender document, an unconditional surrender. That's never going to happen in modern conflict. Uh, and as the political situation changes um, and the political appetite for doing this changes uh, in both the belligerent Country, countries uh, and those that are trying to impose some form of peace on them, uh, you get this movement that's very difficult to measure anything against. And I think what we've seen over the last few days is um, a continuation of the destabilization of the Middle East through, uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to be quite controversial here, uh, a lack of understanding in the decision making and the way you deliver an effect by the President of the United States. You know, there is no doubt that General Soleimani, who had an awful lot of innocent blood on his hands, um, and if he had been brought in front of any international reputable court, could have been prosecuted. There's no doubt that um, uh, he was a threat to the United States at the time and the US had a, a, a right to uh, protect themselves. But if the answer to that threat was to take him out individually, they could have done it in a, le in a more subtle way and without the president's right thumb but, but hovering Mr. over Mr. his Ingram, tweet Mr. Ingram, let me Let, let me uh, uh, be the devil's gate here. Uh, the argument can also be mounted that as far as blood on people's hands is concerned, uh, then George Bush Sr., uh, George Bush Jr., and many other American uh, politicians, presidents, generals, could also be brought in front of the International Criminal Court. But leaving that point aside, uh, before you uh, joined me, I was talking about, uh, you know, a, a, an excerpt, a quote from Lawrence Friedman's The Future of War, a history. Uh, and, you know, in the 25th chapter, he uh, does a blurb, which is very interesting, and it's actually from uh, Matty Friedman's book, Pumpkin Flowers. Uh, and it says, I'd been at the start of something, of a new era in which conflict surges, shifts or fades, but doesn't end, in which the most you can hope for is not peace or the arrival of a better age, but only to remain safe as long as possible. It's a, it's a scary thought, but it's also factually very accurate, especially when we uh, talk about the greater Middle East. What would you say about this? It, it, it is. I'd agree in the, in the terms of the Middle East. Um, and, and the nature of conflict is changing. You know, if you look at um, where there has been success, and this is tied in with a, a greater understanding of end state and all the rest of it, the Balkans are a perfect example of where the conflict there was absolutely terrible. Uh, you know, horrific crimes being committed, but you can now fly there on holiday, and I have done on several occasions, and was involved in the conflicts in the Balkans. The Middle East is a different matter because we've got the interstate conflicts that are going on. We've got the intergrouping conflicts that are going on. We've got um, effectively what is a, 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 a Sunni-Shia um, civil war that's been going on for a large number of years. And we then got outside um, governments that are trying to come in and bring peace to the area and impose their values in, in the area who don't necessarily quite understand the dynamics that's going on. Throw all that together with a couple of terrorist groups um, that misinterpret the uh, beliefs and um, the belief system that they want to um, throw out there to try and generate supporters. And you've got an extremely difficult situation and a tinderbox that will be a continuously burning um, uh, level of conflict to one degree or other. Uh, and unless the international community as a whole comes together and can bring an influence and a peaceful influence um, on the region, it's likely that um, the, the difficulties are going to continue for some time to come. Yes, I, uh, well, hope, uh, let's hope, and hope is a four-letter word in strategy, as you know. You know, it is a very interesting thing. Uh, General uh, McMaster was speaking somewhere this, this last year, and he talked about four fallacies, and one of the fallacies that he spoke about was what he called the Zero Dark Thirty fallacy. And, and he said, and this was, you know, the discussion on the continuities of war and the future of warfare, and he said the Zero Dark Thirty fallacy, like the vampire fallacy, elevates an important military capability raiding to the level of a defense strategy. And we see, we've seen this uh, in Iraq also, in Afghanistan also. Lots of special uh, forces operations, uh, night raids, uh, insurgents getting killed, but that did not really translate into a victory, a victory 
uh, where you have an open surrender. So this now being the nature of modern or shall I say postmodern war, uh, do you think there is need for states and for politicians to you know, look at it because this then becomes a threshold problem that we need to have the threshold much higher, uh, uh, you know, in order to enter a conflict. The, the threshold to enter conflict and the reasons for entering conflict are extremely complex. But I think there, there's, a, there's a simpler issue that's here. Um, and the simpler issue is that we've got two world orders. We've got no, a world order that can think in multi-generational terms and does think in multi-generational terms. So the Iranian government, um, North Korea, Russia, China, um, uh, and they can think and plan and will plan what they're doing from an effects-based perspective in different generations. And then we've got a lot of Western countries who think in presidential or prime ministerial periods of time in office and are looking for a quick fix. And when that quick fix then becomes a, a Fox News headline or the length of time a Twitter tweet is out there and staying uh, in, in the press, it then becomes very, very difficult to achieve a longer term effect when you're trying to fulfill that short term quick fix that um, is needed um, to fulfill the appetite of the, of the local press or the individuals who are, who are making the decision. That's extremely and dangerous. You get that That's really dangerous. And, and, you know, it seems to me now that the era of sophisticated diplomacy is over because more and more people, of course, Trump included, use Twitter for all the places uh, to, to, you know, uh, declare war or declare strikes or actually talk about policy. But before uh, I wind up, uh, Mr. Ingram, uh, there's, a, there's a great book by one of the British infantry officers uh, from the first um, Gurkha Battalion, uh, Captain Emile Simpson, War from the Ground Up. And he had a vignette in the book, uh, and he talks about the fact that in April 1975, in Hanoi, a week before the fall of Saigon, Colonel Harry Summers of the U.S. Army told his North Vietnamese counterpart, Colonel Tu, you never beat us on the battlefield, to which Tu replied, that may be so, but that is also irrelevant. I, it seems to me that that's a very important lesson uh, of, of modern wars. Would you agree? I, I agree completely, and that, and that sums it up perfectly. Um, you know, the body count, the tactical battles, um, you can win as many of those as you want, but you'll lose the campaign completely. And that's the danger of what's happening at the moment, where you've got that dichotomy in thinking. A multi-generational planner, a military planner, multi-generational thinking will always beat those that are looking at the here and now. War at the lowest level, the tactical fight, it doesn't matter what side you're on, it's the same, it's horrific, it's bloody, and the people who suffer most are the innocent civilians that are around. War at the strategic level is something that needs to be carefully thought out, planned, um, uh, only entered under extreme circumstances and with a clear end goal, and we haven't seen that in recent conflicts. We haven't seen that in recent conflicts, and it's likely that we will see it in future conflicts also. But thank you so much. That was Philip Ingram speaking with us. This is all for this week from Indus Special. We shall see you next week at the same time. Meanwhile, for latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.